Uh, so uh, today uh, I'd like to address uh, the relationship between text, vision, and ritual in the case of uh, this famous text, the Amitayus Buddha Contemplation Sutra, Guan Mu Yang Shou Jing. This text, uh, which appeared in China sometime in the fifth century of the Common Era, uh, was and to this day remains one of the most popular Buddhist scriptures in East Asia. Uh, it's famous for its rich and evocative imagery concerning the physical details of the Buddha, Amitayus or Amitabha, and his Pure Land, which it instructs Buddhist practitioners uh, to gradually visualize and thereby come to see with perfect clarity. As one uh, contemporary scholar has put it, the Contemplation Sutra proposes a, quote, soteriology of visualization in which seeing the Pure Land serves as the means of being reborn there. Uh, and it's these instructions for uh, gradually coming to see the Pure Land uh, that you see in the image on the screen here from a Tang Dynasty wall painting, Junho. Um, although this understanding of the Contemplation Sutra and how it works as a set of instructions for visualizing the Pure Land uh, does seem very plausible when we uh, just take up the text and read it. Uh, what I'm gonna propose today uh, is that we can come to a slightly more nuanced understanding of how this text works uh, if we first situate it against its background context. Uh, modern scholars generally agree that the Contemplation Sutra was not uh, the direct translation of an Indian text, which it sort of appears to be, uh, but was composed or perhaps uh, assembled from separate parts uh, in China sometime in the fifth century. So in my talk today, what I'd like to do is situate the Contemplation Sutra's a visually evocative a language against the backdrop of fifth century Chinese ideas about the meaning and function of textual descriptions of meditative vision. I'm gonna suggest that uh, when we do this, we can begin to understand how the Contemplation Sutra works as a self-consciously ritual text. Uh, one in which the rich and evocative visual, visual and visionary imagery within it is indeed very important, uh, but important perhaps in a manner slightly different uh, than has sometimes been thought. Um, among uh, scholars of Buddhism, the Contemplation Sutra is often invoked uh, as perhaps the most important and detailed guide to the decisively uh, vision, visually oriented form of the traditional practice of Buddhanus Murti, the recollection of Buddha, uh, which is known to have been popular and become popular in the Buddhist world in the first centuries of the Common Era. The heart of these instructions is found within the central part of the Contemplation Sutra, where we find this very famous sequence of 16 different, uh, what the text calls Guan, or contemplations or visualizations as the word is usually understood in this context. Uh, even though the text titles each of these 16 sections a guan, uh, only the first 13 of them are usually thought of as being uh, meditation instructions per se. It's often hypothesized that these 13 practices were originally an independent meditation manual of some kind uh, that at a certain point in time for reasons that remain speculative uh, came to be joined with the other parts of the text. On the face of it, these first 13 Guan sections do indeed seem to present what seems to be a graded sequence of different visual objects of meditation, beginning with the setting sun and pure water or ground of the pure land, and then proceeding up through several uh, richly detailed scenes involving the Buddha, uh, Amitayus or Amitabha and his attendants in all their splendor. It's these sequences uh, that is depicted uh, here on the image again for the first eight contemplations uh, in the Dunhuang mural. Each of these sections of the text begins by instructing the practitioner to contemplate guan or imagine xiang, the objects in question. Uh, the objects themselves are then described in visually rich language. So just as one example of this, I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with this text, uh, but to give an example, the ninth contemplation uh, which is the contemplation of Amitayus himself, begins as follows. Right? Uh, when the previous exercise of imagination is complete, next one must contemplate the radiance of the body of the Buddha Amitayus. Ananda, you should know that the body of the Buddha Amitayus is as radiant as 100,000 million pieces of gold. The blue of his eyes is like the waters of the four oceans, and so forth and so forth. This description of the body of the Buddha continues uh, for some time and is very quite elaborate. At the end, we're then told that whoever sees all these things uh, will be freed from a great deal of evil karma. Uh, and at the end of the section, uh, it's explicitly said that this is contemplation number, 19, number nine. Uh, but the question I wanna ask here is what exactly, uh, if anything, do passages like this, visually evocative passages, instruct us or a 
practitioner to do? Or at least how might um, someone in fifth century China, a fifth century Chinese Buddhist, have thought about this question? Uh, since this long account here of the light of Amitayos's body occurs right after we're instructed, or when the Buddha says to contemplate on the radiance of the body of the Buddha. At first glance, I think it is not unreasonable to think that we should take the visually rich descriptions that follow as being instructions. That is to say that the visually evocative language here should be understood as presenting something like the content of what the practitioner is supposed to contemplate or visualize. Uh, this is how we take things, I think, when we identify the contemplation sutra uh, as being or as here containing, uh, in terms of its genre, a visualization or meditation manual of some kind, right? So to say this, in other words, is to make a claim, to, to call it a manual for meditation, is to make a claim not only about the contents of the text itself, but also about uh, what pragmatic force we think the words of the text would have had or were intended to have. Uh, to say this is not, I think, to say that the Contemplation Sutra was necessarily or always used as a meditation manual, um, but it's to say that they would have been understood by contemporaneous audiences as normatively being that kind of thing, a set of instructions. Um, but note uh, that to say this about the Contemplation Sutra, or at least this passage here that I show you, goes at least somewhat beyond what the text literally says. Here in the ninth contemplation, at least on a purely literal level, the Buddha seems to be simply describing the body of Amitayus, following which he says that anyone who sees it will gain great benefit. Uh, clearly we are being instructed, a reader or a practitioner is being instructed to do something called Guan, right? The radiance of the Buddha. Uh, and clearly the Buddha then describes this radiance in visually evocative language. But the relationship between these two parts of the text is not necessarily made explicit. All of this is to say simply the following, uh, that very often at least, it's not so much the content of this text that tells us that it is a manual for visualizing the Buddha as it is rather our classification of the text as a manual that tells us how to understand the pragmatic force of its rich visually evocative language. This uh, observation is, I freely admit, rather trivial. Uh, but I think it's worth making, and I want to make it today, because it opens up a concrete historical question. Namely, at the time uh, when the Contemplation Sutra was put together in the fifth century in China, as I've said, uh, what was generally understood to be the purpose or pragmatic force of visually evocative descriptions of the extraordinary things that successful Buddhist practitioners uh, might come to see? Uh, to answer this question, we need to cast our gaze, as it were, a little bit more widely. Uh, and uh, one place I think we can do this is within this uh, genre of texts, the technical meditation treatises, or Chan Jing, Chan scriptures, that appeared in China around the same time as the Contemplation Sutra. Uh, some of these texts were translations of Indian scriptures or texts, but others were Chinese compilations or compositions. I call these texts um, technical meditation treatises because they guide practitioners through the formal stages of Buddhist dhyana or chan in Chinese, uh, and because they're based on classical Buddhist meditation exercises like contemplation of the breath, contemplation of impurity, the Ashupa Bhavana, and so forth. Now, I should just say that these sources are definitely relevant to the question of the Contemplation Sutra, because at this time in China, in the fifth century, the practice of meditation as chan uh, was seen as intimately connected to whatever it is that is being proposed uh, in the Contemplation Sutra. Uh, just for example, of a place we can see this, the Indian Buddhist monk uh, named Kalayashas, who is uh, later remembered as the translator of the Contemplation Sutra. He is described, if we look at his sixth century biography, he's described as a being a Chan Shi, a master of Chan. His biography presents him as teaching Chan and as translating the Contemplation Sutra as two aspects of his sort of uh, missionary work. Uh, this is also true, I should say, of other translators who were associated with other texts from within the Contemplation Sutra genre. And there are several other texts that are similar to it. Uh, and some of those other translators are also actually claimed to have been the translators of some of these Chan Jing or meditation scriptures. 
So all of this is to say simply that the Chan scriptures, the Chan Jing, uh, and texts like the Contemplation Sutra clearly were understood as being part of a similar context, and they probably emerged in that context, same shared context. Um, of particular importance in this regard are the following three texts in which meditative visions play a prominent role. As uh, Polina said uh, when introducing, I've recently published um, some studies of uh, these texts in particular. So I just, I'm gonna summarize a few things about um, how I understand them and uh, the role that meditative visions play in them. And then I'm gonna go on to use this to sort of uh, think about the contemplation sutra itself. Now, uh, despite uh, being framed when we read them as methods for traditional, let's just say med Buddhist meditation practices, contemplation of impurity and so forth, uh, like the Guanwu Yang Shou Jing, the Contemplation Sutra, uh, these three Chan scriptures place a great deal of emphasis on visions and visionary experience. But what we also find in these texts and that we don't find in the Contemplation Sutra itself is a bit more information about the role that visions were imagined as playing in the life of an actual Buddhist practitioner. And from this information, I think we can make some inferences about how contemporaneous audiences would have thought about textual descriptions of visions. Uh, and this in turn is gonna give us, I hope, a new angle for thinking about the contemplation. Uh, the first point to note is that in these three texts here, these Chanjing, elaborate meditative visions are often presented as relatively spontaneous occurrences. That is to say, not as things that the meditator is supposed to visualize or imagine on purpose. Uh, in the so-called uh, secret essential methods of meditation, the first text here, uh, it begins with a detailed set of instructions for the traditional Buddhist meditation practice of contemplation of impurity. Uh, but at the end of this section, uh, it is said that a meditator who follows these instructions uh, will see the following thing. Four demons will suddenly spring out of the ground, their eyes flaming, their tongues like poisonous snakes. Each head has six heads. Each, uh, each has six heads and each head is different. One like a mountain, the rest like a cat, et cetera, et cetera. So this long description of a vision. Uh, from what follows later in the text, it becomes clear that this vision, and I, this is just a very small part of it, it goes on for quite uh, some way. Uh, this vision is presented as serving as the confirmation that the meditator has completed the contemplation of impurity. Uh, within the Chan scriptures as a genre, uh, it's within these confirmatory visions, which is the term I use to refer to them, uh, where we find the most detailed, visually rich imagery. It's important to note uh, that the confirmatory visions like this one here do not usually have any obvious connection to the content of the initial topic of meditation. So this vision of the a demon springing out of the ground, for example, is said to confirm the success of the contemplation of impurity, which is presented as uh, imagining decaying corpses, right? So in other words, the imagery that we see within the con confirmatory visions is not prefigured within the meditation practice itself. Uh, indeed, uh, sometimes confirmatory visions are described uh, in the case of meditation practices that themselves have no visual component at all. Uh, in one passage from the same text here, the meditator is told to contemplate emptiness and, and to do so using a very traditional, stereotypical, a discursive formula of, of doctrine. But then success is said to be confirmed by the appearance of an elaborate concrete vision. Uh, there's a lot of similarity between this sort of system and uh, various forms of meditation that are known uh, in somewhat simpler terms uh, from Indian Buddhist texts and I discuss these matters uh, in my books if you're curious about them. But what I wanna stress for now is simply uh, that within this broad genre of uh, fifth, cent uh, fifth century Chinese uh, Chanjing or meditation texts, we can see very clearly that what I'm calling a confirmatory visions are not supposed to be part of the meditation instructions. Normatively, at least, these are not things that one is trying to visualize or imagine. Uh, this is seen, I would say, most clearly when we note that within these Chan scriptures, uh, not all of the visions like this confirm success. Sometimes a method of meditation is presented following which there is described a detailed vision, but the vision is then said to be bad or inauspicious in some way, meaning it means that the practitioner has evil karma that has to be expiated in a ritual of repentance, or maybe that the practitioner has gone, uh, gone off the right track somehow and is about to be driven insane. So the very framing of these passages as inauspicious visions makes it very clear that they cannot have been possibly intended and would not have been read by audiences 
path and structure, right? Uh, visually rich and evocative descriptions of meditative visions are patently presented in these sources uh, for the purpose of making it possible for someone to understand the meaning of them should they occur to someone. Um, we have a few very basic hints about how this might have worked uh, in practice from a different Chan scripture known as the Five Gates, which presents a kind of dialogue between a meditation master and a meditation practitioner. I won't go through this in detail, but suffice it to say that in this text, the master prescribes or instructs topics that the practitioner is supposed to contemplate, one, and then the practitioner then reports back various visions of that result. And depending on what is reported, the master then assigns other topics. So in a, in a context like this, these meditative visions are, we might call them divinatory. They're again, not things that the meditator is instructed to try to visualize, uh, but things that advanced meditators will report having experienced and on whose basis someone else can judge their success. Uh, and examples of this model uh, can be found in, in many other kinds of sources uh, from the Tana. And again, I refer you to my, uh, my recent book about this. So to sum it up, uh, it would seem that in fifth century China, there was a reasonably widely shared understanding that meditative visions, or at least the most important of such visions, are, are not things that occur when practitioners of meditation consciously set out to visualize those things. The pragmatic force of textual descriptions of such visions is therefore not that of instruction. These textual passages are rather descriptions, descriptions of the most significant visions that might occur as the result of other practices. Uh, and this can include, as I said, uh, visions whose meaning is negative or inauspicious. Uh, indeed, making it possible to distinguish between these two things, to distinguish between which visions are auspicious and which are inauspicious, which are good and which are bad. This seems to have been one of the motivations uh, for writing down the content of the visions in texts uh, in the first place. So with this sort of uh, basic set of ideas in mind, I now want to return to the main topic of my talk, which is the Contemplation Sutra. For someone familiar with uh, the meditation treatises that I've just described, the chanting, how would the central section of the Contemplation Sutra, the so-called 16 Contemplation, what, what would this have appeared like? What I would like to propose, simply put, is that just like the long and detailed confirmatory visions recorded in the Chan scriptures, the detailed visual imagery presented in the Contemplation Sutra would not have been seen so much as a set of instructions for how to practice, but a set of descriptions of the kind of visions that successful practitioners have. Now, again, uh, this distinction might seem to you uh, somewhat trivial at first, but it brings me to the heart of the argument that I want to make here. This is because whatever the pragmatic force that the Contemplation Sutra might have been imagined as having from a purely normative point of view, as instruction versus description. Uh, if we look on the ground, right, we have good reason for thinking that most Buddhist practitioners interacted with this text uh, by chanting it. During the ritual events known as fast assemblies, perhaps, Jai Hui, uh, which during this era became, uh, for Chinese Buddhists, one of the most important ritual uh, practices for both the laity and the clergy. This at least is the conclusion about the use of these texts that is reached uh, not only with reference to the Amitayus Contemplation Sutra, but other related contemplation texts uh, in this PhD dissertation, which I just wanted to put up because uh, it remains unpublished and hasn't seemed to attract uh, much scholarly attention, but I think it, it's very, very good uh, if you're interested in this topic of how these contemplation sutras were sort of used during the time. Uh, and this now brings me to the heart of the point I want to try to make today. If we think of the Contemplation Sutra, uh, if we think that the Contemplation Sutra began its life as a set of instructions for visualization meditation practice, uh, when we realize that on the ground, the text often serves as a chanted liturgy, uh, this might lead us to see a kind of conflict, right? Between the normative intention of the original text and then the way it comes to be used in a social context. That is to say, we might be tempted to feel that when it's chanted, as a liturgy, the original purpose of the Contemplation Sutra as a manual for meditative visualization was being subverted or forgotten or something, right? That the difficult practice of visualizing the Pure Land was being replaced by an easier practice of merely ritually chanting a text. 
or conversely, but still within the same paradigm, we might see this as a positive development, right? And this is the interpretation actually of the contemplation sutra that one typically finds in say the Japanese Pure Land tradition, right? Which reads the text as making the claim that complex visualization meditation is not necessary, that the practice of simply chanting the Buddha's name is enough for salvation. But what I'd like to propose is that when we read the Contemplation Sutra in light of this broader understanding of meditative visions uh, that I, we find in the Chan scriptures, we can see why the mere recitation of the Contemplation Sutra might have been a more interesting and thoughtful practice uh, than has been previously recited. Um, in particular, I want to suggest that the recitation of descriptions of ideal or hoped for visions uh, fits quite easily within a framework that is recognizable from more general theories of ritual practice. Namely, the idea that ritual is something like the simulation, approximation, or evocation of desired ends through some other more easily controlled medium. Uh, that many theories of ritual take something like this as their starting point. Uh, we might, for example, think of it uh, in terms of a very old fashioned idea, that of sympathetic magic. Uh, but maybe better, we could look to a, a more nuanced formulation uh, like that of Jonathan Z. Smith here, which would have us take ritual as, and here I quote this very famous passage, performing the way things ought to be in conscious tension with the way things actually are in such a way that the ritualized perfection is recollected in the ordinary uncontrolled course of things. Now, uh, whatever uh, theory of ritual we apply in this way of looking at things, speaking the words of the contemplation sutra aloud in ritual uh, is not something we should think of, I would say, as second best to the visualization or meditation that we might imagine the text as actually proposing. Ritual recitation rather would be something more than what the text is literally proposing. Liturgical recitation is then the ritual evocation of an ideal meditative vision. This evocation begins as the mere description of a visionary experience that happens to someone else, but it is hoped one that might eventually become at least partially real for us here now in the present. And indeed uh, is inst instantiated in the spoken words or chanted words of these visions uh, can already said be said uh, through this alone to become kind of shadowy or palpably present in some way. Um, I, I think we shouldn't indeed neglect the power of mere recitation, if we want to call it that. To chant aloud a text rich in visual description like Contemplation Sutra uh, could be seen as what um, scholar Elaine Scarry in a very different context calls imagining under authorial instruction. Uh, as she proposes it, imagining under authorial instruction, which is to say essentially reading, merely reading or chanting in this case, visually evocative words. This actually produces an experience or might in, in her analysis that in at least one respect simulates true vision better than any self-directed imagining or visualizing can. Namely, when we imagine under authorial instruction, similar to what happens during actual perception, our experience is constrained by something outside of ourselves, the external world in actual perception or the author's words in the case of reading or chanting, and is therefore not just under our own personal control. In any case, um, to return to the contemplation sutra, I think it is particularly notable that unlike essentially uh, all of the contemporaneous formal meditation texts that I discussed earlier, the Contemplation Sutra does not include any description of inauspicious vision, of the kind that we know were generally assumed to be possible in most circumstances. In other words, compared to the normal understanding of the range of visions that would be described in a meditation text, the visions described in the Contemplation Sutra are patently ideal. These are not the visions whose occurrence was thought most likely or probable or common, but the visions whose occurrence was most desired, or most auspicious. Uh, we see a hint of this perhaps in the repeating refrain that is found in the Contemplation Sutra that concludes each of the sections. This line is usually translated as something like, to contemplate like this is correct contemplation, 
to contemplate otherwise is wrong contemplation. This again is then merely taken as, this is merely taken as an assertion that this text's methods are the best. Uh, but the word here that's usually rendered as wrong here uh, certainly has the potential for much more dramatic connotations, not just wrong, but inauspicious or even demonic in some way. Uh, in light of the widespread idea that those who meditate could easily encounter inauspicious visions, this recurring line uh, might be taken this way as an acknowledgement that other visions might occur and that the ones described in the Contemplation Sutra are therefore understood to be ideal visions in this sense. Uh, so far, I've been speaking primarily about images and visual imagery in the sense of textual accounts of, of visual imagery, rather than in the sense of actual physical images of the Buddha, uh, which are, I want to make clear, a very important part for understanding the context of the Contemplation Sutra. I can only touch on this very briefly, um, but suffice it to say that any ritual use of the Contemplation Sutra uh, would take place in conjunction with images of its central deities, uh, shown here uh, from a Kamakura era Japanese uh, folding screen. Amitabha in the center and his sort of attendance on the side. Indeed, many previous scholars have noted the likelihood of a close connection between the Contemplation Sutra and other related Contemplation Sutras uh, and the explosive growth in image worship and construction uh, in Chinese Buddhism during the fifth century. A, a full treatment of this topic is I can't really get into today, but let me just briefly suggest that it may be productive to think about the role of physical icons uh, in terms similar to those that I have used to analyze the visual imagery within the text itself. In other words, in a context where visions of the sort described in the Contemplation Sutra were valued as signs of spiritual progress or purification, physical images or icons of the Buddhist deities, such as Amitayus here, that the practitioner was hoping to see in a vision, would be, I think, doubly significant. Uh, such images would, on the one hand, have been understood as powerful presences in their own right, as consecrated Buddhist icons always are. But I would also like to suggest that as purely visual objects, even if they were seen by ritual participants only very briefly or dimly or from a great distance, that these objects would also have served as what we might call a ritualized vision. By ritualized vision, I mean an experience of seeing understood as a partial, simulated, or anticipatory version of an actual vision that it was hoped might eventually occur. That is to say, the replication through a controlled medium of the physical icon and ritual participant of something that might potentially become a reality and whose initial occurrence in ritualized virtual form was itself thought to effectuate or help effectuate this happening. What I'm proposing here, just to make clear, should be contrasted with the idea that physical icons or images were used as tools or props for the meditative practice of visualization. This is an idea that has been much discussed in, in the context of the Contemplation Sutra, which is a little bit different, I think, than what I'm suggesting. In any event, this notion of a ritualized vision can, I think, be seen somewhat more explicitly in other areas of medieval Chinese Buddhism and medieval Chinese Buddhist practice. Accounts of the moment of death, for example, frequently describe visions experienced by the dying person of an envoy or envoys coming from the Pure Land to greet the dying person. Ideally, this envoy would be the Buddha himself from the Pure Land, typically Amitabha. Uh, hagiographies and other sources, miracle tales, frequently describe such occurrences, which are taken as proof of the saintliness of the dying person. Interestingly, when we look to formal instructions for deathbed ritual practice, we find that these same visions are in a sense replicated in ritual form. Uh, in what eventually becomes the standard deathbed ritual practice in East Asia, when someone is about to die, you should set up an image of the Buddha facing East, that is as if coming from the Pure Land in the West, and then position the dying person facing West, ideally sitting in the meditation posture. One must then tie a piece of fabric to the hands of the image and have the dying person hold it while they, and here I quote from a seventh century Chinese source, while they generate a wish to be reborn in the Pure Land. This image here that you're looking at, I've taken from uh, Jackie Stone's book on the topic of deathbed ritual in Japan. And this is an example of an image that was actually used uh, for this purpose. And you can see uh, in the Buddha's hands in the middle, 
that's not actually painting there, that's remnants of the thread that would have been used for one of these cords to tie to the hands of the dying person. Now, uh, there are no doubt many ways one could interpret this kind of uh, ritual procedure uh, at the deathbed, but at least, I think it's at least worth noting that part of what these procedures do is create a ritual simulation of the kind of deathbed vision, that is a vision of Amitayus coming from the West to greet you. A vision whose significance would have been widely understood and whose occurrence would no doubt have been eagerly hoped for. This talk of deathbed visions now brings me to my final observation about the Contemplation Sutra. The reading that I am proposing for the nature uh, of the intended function of this text's visually evocative language about the Buddha and the Pure Land can also, I want to suggest now finally, help explain a feature of this text that has long vexed modern and traditional interpreters. As I mentioned, the central section of the Contemplation Sutra presents 16 numbered contemplations of one. Uh, even though uh, within the uh, Contemplation Sutra, each section is numbered and titled in the same way. Uh, the first 13 and the last three have traditionally been interpreted uh, as fundamentally different from each other. Only the first 13 are thought to be a meditation manual or meditation instructions of any kind. And the last three are excluded from this reckoning uh, precisely because they are patently not framed as meditation instructions. It's here in these last three where we find uh, what everyone seems to agree are merely descriptions of what it is like when the different ranks of practitioners, the famous nine grades, attain rebirth in the Pure Land. But these final three contemplations then, 14 through 16, are primarily seen to be a matter of good old fashioned Buddhist doctrine, particularly uh, the fact, the way that these final sections seem to suggest that rebirth in the Pure Land is possible even for the worst sinners, as long as they just uh, say the name of the Buddha a few times before they die. Uh, this division between the first 13 contemplations, which are meditative in some way, and the last three, uh, which are something else, this was noted, as I said, already by medieval Chinese commentators like Shandong. Um, in the interpretation of the, the contemplation sutra that is usually favored in the Japanese Pure Land traditions, uh, it's these final three contemplations, the non-meditative ones, right, that are the, actually the most significant. Uh, in the introduction to the English translation of the Contemplation Sutra that was published by uh, Ryukoku University, uh, this is explained as follows, quote, the last three contemplations hold the key to the author's intention, while the first three contemplations can be understood, first 13 contemplations, excuse me, can be understood as an introduction, not rather than a guide, to lead readers to the last three contemplations. So in other words, in this kind of Japanese Pure Land interpretation, the first 13 contemplations were included in the text, not because these are practices that anyone should try to do, but rather because, and here again, I quote from this introduction, up to the time when the sutra was written, the practices of the first 13 contemplations were established and authorized. Whereas those of the final three contemplations which advocates saying the Buddha's name were not. So the Pure Land interpretation sees this as leading from traditional meditation practices to this new practice supposedly of just saying the Buddha's name. Now, even if we don't accept this reading of the overall meaning of the Contemplation Sutra, the contrast between the thir first 13 contemplations and the last three is, is hard to ignore. It has often been seen at the very least as establishing a plausible textual history to the Contemplation Sutra, namely as showing that the text was created by joining a manual of visualization meditation, the first 13, uh, to an originally separate text that had to do with uh, rebirth in the Pure Land, the last three. Nevertheless, if as I've suggested, we read the first 13 contemplations as also being normatively descriptions of ideal visions, more so than prescriptions for some kind of specific meditation practice, the contrast between the first 13 and last three, these two sections, becomes somewhat less than has usually been imagined. For in this reading that I'm proposing, both the first 13 and the last three contemplations are normatively descriptions of hoped for fruits. The distinction now lies only in the difference between a hoped for vision of the Buddha in this lifetime versus a hoped for rebirth in the next lifetime. But actually even this distinction breaks down when we look more closely for even within the final three contemplations, uh, the account of how those of the nine ranks are reborn in the Pure Land, 
even here we do find descriptions of visions that one might experience during life while still alive. Uh, indeed, visions that we know and assume that medieval Chinese Buddhists would have desperately hoped for, namely deathbed visions could be experienced by those who merit the nine ranks. Thus, within the 14th contemplation, it's said that someone of the second rank, the, upper, the middle upper rank, when their life is about to end, Amitabha Buddha, together with his attendants, surrounded by a host of followers, will arrive before the practitioner holding a pedestal of purple gold. The practitioner will see himself seated on this pedestal and so forth. Each rank of rebirth is explained as seeing a different scene like this at the moment of death. These deathbed visions, moreover, show a curious symmetry with respect to the initial 13 contemplations, a symmetry that, as far as I can tell, has not been previously recognized, although if I'm wrong about this, I would love to hear so. The initial 13 contemplations, as I mentioned, begin with a vision of the setting sun, a first partial glimpse of the Pure Land, and then they become gradually more complex in their description and gradually more auspicious in the sense that one sees not just the sun, but then the Pure Land itself and then the Buddha. The deathbed visions for those meriting each of the nine ranks, in contrast, go in the opposite direction since the highest grade of rebirth is listed first and the deathbed visions attesting to this grade are the most auspicious and most complex involving the Buddha himself. Uh, from this point of view then, even though the contrast between the first 13 and final three contemplations, even though there is a contrast, it isn't a radical break so much as it is a well thought out arc. The initial 13 contemplations describe a sequence of visions of increasing complexity and auspiciousness, while the final three describe visions that bring us back in the other direction. Uh, most interesting of all, I think here, is that the final deathbed vision for those of the lowest grade of rebirth, which can be obtained even by the worst sinners, we're told, uh, such people, if they do nothing more than say the name of the Buddha, will experience at the moment of their death the following vision of a sun-like golden lotus. This final vision I uh, would maintain uh, has more than a passing resemblance to the first contemplation, the so-called sun contemplation. In other words, we're left at the end of the contemplation sutra just where we started with a comparatively simple vision of the disk of the sun. One that we are assured can be obtained by almost everyone. If not right now, then at least at the moment of death. So to conclude, Regardless of the textual history of the Contemplation Sutra, it seems to me that we can understand the text in a manner somewhere in between what I would describe as two extreme views. On the one hand, the view that would see the core of this text as a manual for complex meditative visualization, and the other in the kind of Japanese Pure Land view, uh, which would see it as an argument for a decidedly non-meditative vocal invocation of the Buddha's name. Instead, I'd like to propose that we can understand the Contemplation Sutra in its entirety as an elegant and coherent ritual invocation of ideal visions. In this reading, the Contemplation Sutra is therefore not just a ritual text, but a self-consciously ritual text. It was created in an environment in which elaborate visions were believed to occur in the context of advanced meditation and also in the form of deathbed visions. In this environment, textual descriptions of such visions were known to be recorded in great detail in meditation texts, so that the significance of the auspicious and inauspicious visions that occur at such times could be known and understood. The contemplation sutra, I think, expects us to come to the table with something like this understanding of meditation, meditative visions, and textual descriptions of such visions. Read in light of this understanding, the contemplation sutra is then, I would propose, uh, not a manual for visualization that just happens to have come to be used as a liturgy. Rather, from its beginning and with a degree of self-consciousness, it's something more like a visionary prayer. Thank you. <laughs>